Well, so who here uses Ruby? Huh? Yeah, you all do. And who gets really irritated because it's slow all the time? I don't know. So I don't know. Yeah. It's pretty slow. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about why it's slow and how you can make it less slow. Uh, or, as I like to title my talk, Ruby and Rails performance. <laughs> of course, yesterday, Dave Woodward had to tweet this, so the cat's out of the bag. Making your code go faster is really easy, just do this. Find the part that's slow and don't do that anymore. To which I replied, damn it, now I don't have anything to talk about tomorrow. <laughs> and that concludes my talk. No, not really. I actually have some stuff uh, besides that. So Ruby is slow at garbage collection, when you create a lot of objects, when you're doing stupid things, and when you're doing a lot of other things. Uh, enumerable can be a little slow if you're, not, if you're on 187. And it's depending on what version of Ruby you're using, different things are slow. And basically the only way to figure out if something is slow is to try it and then be like, holy crap, this is slow. So how do you make it faster? Well, you don't do things that are slow, obviously. Um, you can also use a faster Ruby implementation, especially if you're on 187. Use something else, anything else. It will be faster. Uh, you can do things later. So for example, if you have some process that takes four seconds, and so your user pushes a button, you don't really want them to sit there waiting for it. You can use something else to do it later, and don't do stupid things, uh, which include things like in-memory sorting when you can just use the database. So some slow things that you shouldn't do, uh, n plus one, or two, or three, or 20, don't do that. Uh, those get exponentially slower, uh, by definition. In-memory data manipulations, and I'll get into that in a minute. Things that create lots of or large objects, and things that make external requests. Don't do those while your user's waiting on them. So the biggest one is n plus 1. And there's some really easy ways to fix it, like the bullet gem. You just install it and configure it. Data mapper, load things with include, flatten your data, cache things. Brilliant. So Bullet is on GitHub. Uh, this guy makes it. <laughs> and it puts these helpful little things in your, uh, in your Rails application log. It also makes development go really slow for some reason. Uh, and, and I mean performance. So don't add this to your production config. But uh, it'll give you uh, information, n plus one query path, and it'll give you the model, and then it'll say, add to your finder, include comments, which is nice. So it tells you what to do to make that go away. And I used this for a couple things that were really slow, and it made them less slow. They were still slow, though, because I was using a lot of stuff. Then there's data mapper, and you probably can't read this, but this is right off their web page. Uh, it figures out when you're going to do an n plus one query and doesn't do that. And instead does the right thing, which is pretty slick. Then there's the in-memory data manipulation that you shouldn't do. Uh, sort, match, group by, except group by is fantastic and I use it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but it creates very large objects uh, and nests them, so it, it can be slow. It's, uh, but they're fine in small doses, you know, if you need to sort like five things, it's, it's no point shoving them in the database for it to sort them, sort them in memory. Uh, if you're doing match, you can use the <coughs> equals tilde if you don't need the match data. Um, but they create more objects for garbage collection to clean up, it's usually the biggest thing that and you're doing stuff in memory, so it uses lots of memory. And garbage collection is really slow in Ruby, uh, unless you're using one of the alternative implementations that uh, 
don't have slow garbage collection. Uh, sort uh, has a bang method that you can use that'll prevent it from creating more objects, which is great. And use your database. So if you have a table and you want to load some stuff and you want it to be in the right order, add an order declaration to your finder and your, your database will do it in C, which is much faster than whatever language it uses. Um, so you can use a faster Ruby, like Rubinius, it's my favorite alternative Ruby. Uh, there's also JRuby, MacRuby, uh, you could try to use Maglev, and there's Ruby 1.9. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, KG is 1.8.7, so alternative well, garbage collector. Also RE. Mm -hmm. They're all 187. It's still and one, no, 87 is, is slated for deprecation, so I'm not going to recommend it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> However, we use our EE, and it's quite a lot faster than 186. And QG is faster still. Mm -hmm. uh, when it doesn't seg fault, which it does every time I try to use it. So. Uh, if, if it compiles and runs, you can try it out. Another thing you can do is do stuff later, like Ajax in complicated and slow data. Um, do n plus one on request. So if you have like I don't know a blog post and you have comments with authors, and you want to like load the comment author bio on mouse over, that's better than just doing it automatically, uh, because then you're just loading one piece of data when somebody actually wants it, um, and then. Use delayed job rescue, etc., to defer work. Do stuff later. Don't do it now. Be lazy. That's always faster. Except when your backlog gets really big, then it's not. So then the other thing you need to do is benchmark stuff. Benchmarking is important because that's how you actually know what's slow. So I'm going to give a little introduction to benchmarking. So I've got uh, a really long benchmark script here because I wanted it to put things out in a nice pretty format. So uh, this is a terribly written web application that has to do 20 million uh, e email verifications on every page request or something like that. So I've got uh, actually the RFC spec regex for validating email addresses. So it's nice and long. And I've got some benchmark time objects. You don't have to do this if you don't want to do fun math with your stuff. But if you do, then you do. So I'm doing benchmark. And this will run this loop however many times you specify, so 20 million times. And it's going to run, this one is going to do string.match. And this one is going to do equals tilde. And when it gets done, it's going to put the total times and the percent difference out. And I can put this up on my GitHub afterwards. Uh, so, and this is actually from a Raffle scale tip, so. You know, that's why it has to be run 20 million times to show any difference. So I've got this script here, and I'm using the Unix time tool so that we can compare between rubies. So this is Ruby 187, and it runs and runs and runs, and five and a half, uh, five minutes, or a little, a little more than five seconds, and equals tilde is 41% faster in this run. Terribly unscientific because you know I ran it one time, laptops on battery, totally unrealistic load environment doesn't simulate memory pressure, so on and so on. This is Rubinius, and it runs, same thing. And it was actually a little bit slower, about two tenths of a second slower, um, because it has the better garbage collector, which is a little ironic, but whatever. And uh, actually, equals tilde was 45% slower this time. So, you know, if you just need match to be faster, 
then uh, use Rubinius, if that's your only performance criteria. <laughs> and then 192, which is also not a lot different. Uh, this time it's actually faster, 4.8 seconds. Uh, but equals tilde was 44% faster. So you can see across rubies, you know, like four tenths of a second total difference, 20 million iterations. Uh, don't hunt down all your matches and change them to til equals tilde. Not a very big win. Uh, but if you have something that you think is slow and you come up with another way to do it, this way you can actually come up with a quantitative, this is best. <coughs> And then some minor caveats when doing performance tuning. Don't sacrifice your sanity for performance. It's not worth it. You'll just write bad code. Uh, or PHP. Hey, but it only took one line. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from really crazy performance tricks. Uh, you know, garbage collector tuning, good. Writing your own Ruby implementation, bad. <laughs> <laughs> Freeze all strings. <laughs> uh, and keep your separation of concerns as much as reasonable. Uh, are you done with your presentation? I am. Okay, okay. good. I was going to ask a question. Uh, can you describe a little bit of delayed job? Uh, so delayed job is awesome because it uses your existing database configuration. You create a table for uh, jobs of stuff that you want to do later. And you just call your method, but you add dot .delay before your last method call. And it will serialize your parameters, stick it in that database table, and then you have a delayed job worker that comes and runs it in a separate process. And is that delayed job worker, is that scheduled to run on a regular interval? Or does it kick off just a separate thread whenever? Um, so there's a lot of ways you can do it. Um, you know, we use it here, and we just uh, have it running all the time, and it'll just sit and pull the table. I'm like, is there anything for me to do? And that lets us, sit. we have three workers, so when we do a certain action, it throws 280 jobs in the queue, and then they all work on them, which is pretty crazy, but it works. Anything else? Now, what kind of a time frame are you talking about when you do a delay like that? Uh, usually it's like within a second or two. Now, do you ever run into any kind of consistency problems while it's doing those 262 processes? Or? No, because it's they're all atomic. So they uh, they that's one thing you have to be careful about when you do stuff asynchronously. Is it has to be an atomic operation. Um, so, you know, if you're taking user submission and validating it, don't do that in a delayed job, because then you'll have to send them an email like two <laughs> minutes later. Uh, yeah, that data you sent me is not valid. Click here. I've got the data serialized somewhere, and I'll give you the form back, and you can fix it. Don't do that. But you know, if you've got an upload and you suck it in, and then you need to push it to S3, don't don't make your user wait for it to upload twice. There's also some. Uh, really neat plugins that came from Merv, like run later, which allows you to, instead of persisting it to a database, it actually just takes a block and pushes it on the stack. And after the request responds, it actually executes that block as the next execution. So there's different ways to either delay it to a database. I, I mean, I run, I run seven rescue servers as well. So Seven servers? Yeah. How many workers? Um, there's two workers on every server. So, but the good thing about rescue that I like over delayed job is I run um, four of those servers are JRuby because they work strictly in SOAP and so they sit on top of the J2ED stack that's wrapped under it. And rescue serializes in JSON instead of serializing in Ruby object serialization. So you can like mar Marshall. And so you can't share serialized objects between JRuby and Ruby, whereas in Rescue, if you serialize in JSON, you can. 
all so, sorts of options. They're all pretty cool options. Though. So, my next question about rescue: the difference between and job. Um, so, so rescue uses Redis for its data store, okay. which is like the biggest difference. Because then you have another database to keep running. So you know, if you have a case like he does, where it makes so it's sense. Really just like location. I mean, like it's not an easy consistent database connection. We use Redis and keep your value, right? Like basically, yeah. not fast. Keep yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so, in theory, then that also separates your database um, well, performance, I guess. So if your yeah. if your main uh, database is taking lots of reads or writes. Throwing just into a separate database. So, so when we shove 200 and some jobs into our delayed job, it kind of causes a little blip on the database performance. <laughs> See, I was only worried about like you, you're doing an update and then you're re redirecting them back to a view that then has that row in the table, you know, but the row hasn't been added yet, so now you have this kind of inconsistency in the data yeah. where the user might see that. But if you're talking, you know, a matter of a second, then I guess you just block them in that case. And if they need to see the data after you. Like we, we, have, we have a page that does that, and it just has a meta refresh and a spinner at the top that says we're still populating this. Yeah, I guess we can pull. That's one way of doing it. <laughs> Rescue was actually born out of GitHub because they were crashing their database pretty hard, and they were running a delayed job off of it. And so they wanted to take that load off of their user database. I think Rescue has a little nicer API, um, but yeah. So you call it the same way as like Cloud Rescue? That's a uh, available on any method. Or is it like on a block you call out? This is so you call it on a method, and uh, it kind of like delayed job. You got to be careful about how much stuff you serialize. Yeah. Because if you like take a whole, like if you let your users submit an HTML blob from Word and try and shove it into a delayed job thing, it'll run out of room and it'll just truncate it, but it won't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find that out the hard way? Oh, that's cute. <laughs> so yeah, it does some weird stuff. So you need to, generally, if you, generally I try to just give delayed job an ID. Like, do this on this record. Um, and you can, I believe, you can point it at a separate database with active record. So you can do a little performance isolation that way too. Yeah, that's interesting. If you're like in a pinch. There's also a, a Mongo fork of rescue that I haven't mentioned in a few months, but uh, that's a thing you can do that we wrote. And somebody, somebody else's fork is now the best fork to use, but um, it's out there. I wouldn't start using Mongo just to get that. Uh, Redis is definitely easier to get running. But if you're already using Mongo for something, it's there. All right. Should we start clapping? Yeah, sure. <laughs>